Research has proven that laughter is therapeutic from scholarly studies in medical journals to a Reader's Digest article on five ways to tickle your funny bone. Funny Bones is the title of a show to be performed by Dan Kamen on Saturday afternoon at Spivey Hall. Dan Kamen, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Lois. It seems very fitting that you are a guest on City Lights since that is also the name of a classic film made in 1931 by Charlie Chaplin. And Chaplin is at the heart and essence of Funny Bones. When did you first become interested in Chaplin? Well, Chaplin was erased from the culture of my childhood, uh, the 50s, 60s, uh, for reasons that have more to do with politics than art or obsolescence, because he wasn't obsolete anywhere else in the world. Uh, so I didn't see him until I, my college campus ran an illegal print of a Chaplin film midway through my college career, and it, 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 it simply bowled me over. I, I thought it was the best film I'd ever seen, and I didn't understand why I'd never seen or heard of this guy before. What were the political reasons? Well, Chaplin ran afoul. He, he made a film in 1940 uh, about Hitler, uh, lampooning Hitler. It was called The Great Dictator. He called him Adnoid Hinkle, uh, the dictator of, of Tomania. Uh, the official government line was, don't do anything to aggravate the Europeans. It's their problem. And here he made this film lampooning Hitler as, an, as, as a buffoon, and uh, it was a year before Pearl Harbor was attacked. So even though the film was very well received in the United States, rapturously received, made more money than any other film he ever made. People wanted to see Charlie Chaplin reclaiming his mustache that, uh, in many people's opinion, cartoonists had a field day lampooning Hitler themselves by comparing him to Charlie Chaplin because of that common mustache, that little black square mustache. Uh, and so Chaplin reclaimed his mustache and did something that he felt was his responsibility as an artist who'd gained an international uh, following uh, uh, people who wanted to see his next film to do, which to, was to make a tremendous unequivocal statement that stop, stop this guy now, he's insane. Let's stop him before it gets any worse. But by the 50s and 60s, certainly that idea should have changed. I mean, government opposition, we know the outcome of what happened after 1940. Well, we're having culture wars now, and they've always been happening. And after the war, the, the government swung right, as it has now. And people who were against Hitler before the official line was to be against Hitler. Also, the temerity of an, a mere entertainer uh, having the presumption to try to influence public opinion about something as, as critical as should we get involved in an international incident in a war. Um, those people were considered uh, left-wing uh, radicals. And in fact, Chaplin was always considered, he was left-wing. Uh, he was what later became disparagingly called a limousine liberal, meaning he was a Hollywood personality like Barbara Streisand, who's rich, but who gets very involved in social justice causes. Uh, at that time, there were very few actors who publicly did that. We don't know what Alfred Hitchcock's politics were, and we don't care. Stan Laurel's, uh, but Chaplin, we did care. They, they were Brits who never became uh, American citizens. Well, Hitchcock did late in his life. Stan Laurel never did. Chaplin was a Brit who never became an American citizen, and suddenly that became a public issue. Is he a, a traitor? Is he a communist? Especially as the commu as the Red Scare of the Cold War heated up. And so the government uh, began waging a campaign. You see, they couldn't fire him. They couldn't blacklist him. It was the time of the blacklist. And they couldn't blacklist him because he owned the studio. He was one of the four artists who created United Artists in 1919. So <laughs> um, he was in a position of being able to to finance and distribute his own films, what they could do is turn public opinion against him. And they did that uh, in, a, in a very, very coordinated campaign in the late 40s and early 50s that ultimately drove him out of the country. Mm. You're actually part of the movie 
Chaplin, made in 1992 with Robert Downey Jr. in the title role. What was your contribution to that film? Well, I did something really stupid. I, I, I wrote a book about Charlie Chaplin because I was, I was so enthralled with that film that I saw that I wanted to somehow know more about it. I read every book I could find, but I didn't find the book that I wanted to read, which was the book that explained why jokes that are made now it's over a hundred years ago. His first films were made in 1914. Why jokes made that long ago are still funny. And ultimately, to answer that question, I, I, well, first of all, I was so fascinated with the fact that he could make people laugh without talking that I became a physical comedian, a mime artist myself. Once I began doing that, I began seeing those films as I would watch them again and again in on a on the level of craft. And ultimately, I realized the only way I could read the book that I wanted to read was to write it. And who was going to read that? But one of the people was Robert Downey, who looked at it and said oh, instantly, well, this is like a training manual for my film. And he called me up in Pittsburgh, where I live, and said, I think you may be the only person who can help me pull this off. And he got me hired by the production to coach him uh, to be chaplain. But it became more than that, because uh, when I was sent the script, I realized that the it wasn't it wasn't viable. You know, making a movie about Charlie Chaplin is sort of like composing a symphony about Beethoven. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's you know he made the best movies about Charlie Chaplin that could be made, and uh, the the physical comedy recreations. This is a lost art now because it's not what. Every once in a while, there's a, a talented comedian who does a bit of physical comedy, early years Woody Allen, early years Steve Martin, Robin Williams, um, but then they abandoned it. It's not a world that supports it very much anymore. Uh, so uh, when I realized that the physical comedy they were going to recreate, well, they weren't recreating. If they were recreating, it would have been easier, but they wanted to do things for the context of the fictionalized movie. Um, they weren't going to be funny. And when I met the director, Richard Attenborough, I uh, explained that to him and that uh, I wouldn't be able to help Robert be funny in scenes that were not written funny. And without missing a beat, he said, of course, my, my boy, and this is what you will do for us. And so I ended up creating a number of the film's comedy scenes that were not recreations. Also a recreation of the film, The Immigrant, a scene in The Immigrant, one of his wonderful films in which he is an immigrant, something that's very timely again. Uh, and uh, Geraldine Chaplin, who played her own grandmother in the movie, when they were showing um, rushes, thought that they were actually uh, showing scenes from The Immigrant, which was my greatest compliment. I can imagine. Uh, and Robert, uh, Robert and I uh, began a daily regimen. He flew to Pittsburgh two weeks after, and we began the formidable task because, again, performing as an actor, playing the role of Charlie Chaplin, would be as if they said, Lois, we're going to do a film about Beverly Sills, and we'd like you to play <laughs> Beverly. And by the way, no dubbing because you have to do the voice, because Chaplin's art was the way he moved. And the first thing Robert said to me when he walked in uh, in Pittsburgh was, I want you to tell me how to hold my fork. And that because when you see newsreel footage of Chaplin, he always moved in this astonishingly graceful, dance-like way. And uh, that's not something that came naturally, doesn't come naturally to, to to any of us, really, to, to um, you know, most of us next to Charlie Chaplin look like we're encased in suits of armor. And yet, did he have any formal training in movement? Not a bit, not a bit, nor acting. He was, uh, you know, he was somebody who was in the right sh place at the right time, and he had a, just this great inner spirit about him, and he always had this, he's always been a gifted actor. He, you know, as we know now, he's the biggest actor in the world. He has this wonderful way of delivering lines that sounds so spontaneous and witty, and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the only thing that's really memorable about those, these superhero kind of movies he's been doing, but you wait for him because he's always, he's always funny. He's just got brilliant, he's a brilliant instinctual actor, and he loved doing the work we did because we had to change his posture. We had to change, I had to talk with him about and show him uh, and drill hour after hour, how do you hold that fork? Because we wanted him to, Robert agreed, you know, he wanted Chaplin, his Chaplin, to be like Chaplin, and anybody who wrote about Chaplin, which was everybody who encountered him, uh, uh, people when he became famous, I mean, you know, he was a celebrity among celebrities, and Einstein, uh, George Bernard Shaw, people with, you know, James Barry who wrote Peter Pan, were, you know, were 
and were thrilled to be in his presence because, as uh, Alistair Cook said, who one, one of the people who was lucky enough to, to have a, a friendship with Chaplin, uh, watching him eat was like watching a magician do a magic show. You, you didn't see why, where the food was going somehow, or if, if a truck would approach him as he was uh, crossing the street, he would dodge it like a matador. Uh, everything was like a performance. It was just Chaplin's uh, default. It was his natural way of, of being in the world. Mm-hmm. And we wanted Robert, I wanted Robert very much to partake as much as possible of that wonderful quality that Chaplin had of, of, of grace and, and elan and wit. Oh, I thought he was marvelous in the role. And, and you know, inhabited... Um, a sound world and a contemporary world that in the 90s was the only real reference we had for Chaplin. Yeah, for many people, I think their image of what who Charlie Chaplin was is from Robert Downey's performance in that film. And I was, I was so, he was a delightful person and he is a delightful person. I was so privileged to be able to come full circle and, you know, pay back because I don't, play Charlie Chaplin myself in my shows. I don't do Chaplin. We don't need me to do Chaplin. Instead, uh, we in my Funny Bones program, we show the best print in the world of a classic comedy that almost nobody will have seen. It's a short comedy called The Pawn Shop. Uh, and then I leave the audience in peeling the layers of it to see what makes the heart beat. Why is it still fun? What's funny? What's, what's still making us laugh a hundred years later? Because uh, like with a great piece of music, the more you hear it, the the deeper you go in it. And I found uh, I all that that first experience where I was mowed down by my first Chaplin film, which was The Gold Rush. Um, it, it, my pleasure hasn't diminished. I still keep finding new new little things. I just found a new thing in the pawn shop, which I've used in this program for years, and and I'll be introducing it on uh, just a new little revelation watching his performance because uh, his his physical comedy is on such a level uh, of sophistication that you it's like a great well, like Mozart or Bach. You don't exhaust it by drinking from it. You perform with symphony orchestras as well as solo shows. What music will be involved in the Spivey Hall performance? Spivey Hall has brought in Stephen Ball, who is a renowned, a world-renowned accompanist of silent films, and he's going to accompany the pawn shop in the way that it was accompanied in 1916 when it came out with live music. And uh, again, a specialty area. There's a handful of people, and I know a lot of them, and uh, who have this amazing gift he wouldn't have had to even look at the film. He's familiar with it, but he wouldn't have had to because he's so good as the people who played music in the silent movie. There's a legend that it's it was a pianist, a solo pianist, uh, looking up, squinting up at the screen. Only the smallest theater would have had just a pianist. Uh, any theater of any size would have had a theater organ, which had all kinds of sound effects as well, uh, or a, a, a full symphony orchestra of 50 people, pit, playing and the movies ran from 10 in the morning till till 11 at night. Um, they were so popular that uh, the live music experience was part of the movie experience then. And it gives movies, a stra- it gives the silent movies, when you hear them with live music, this strange, un- almost uncanny sense of reality because there's a living person participating in them. Mm. Well, Dan Kim and I want to thank you for joining us appropriately on City Lights and especially for taking us into the artist's process, both Chaplin's and your own. It's really been a pleasure. Oh, it's a-